afternoon. Okay. Thank you all for coming here today. I'm honored to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Nehemiah Roll. Nehemiah is a 2015 graduate of Wake Forest University with a Bachelor of Arts in Politics and International Affairs and a minor in Middle East and South Asia Studies. He's currently the Presidential Fellow in the Office of the Provost. <laughs> <laughs> Nehemiah was president of the Roosevelt Institute at Wake Forest, a student-led, student-run organization dedicated to progressive public policy change and idea empowerment. He was also an associate editor of the Wake Forest Journal of International Affairs and a public engagement fellow in the Pro-Humanitate Institute. I, I figured there'd be another shout out there. <laughs> as well as a resident advisor. Another shout out? Okay. <laughs> I've only got 60 seconds, so, all right. Nehemiah was one of the recipients of the Wake Forest University 2015 Martin Luther King Jr. Building the Dream Award, and that has brought him here today. Since 2011, the Library Lecture Series has invited one of the past year's recipients of this honor to speak at our annual MLK Day event, uh, which the library has held since 2006. As well as a Nehemiah has been an inspiration to me during the time I've known him. I've sought his wise counsel on more than one occasion, and I know you'll be inspired by him here today. Nehemiah? Nehemiah? All right, great. Cool. Well, let's go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> when I was first asked to give this lecture, I didn't know what to talk about. I toyed with the idea of just showing cat videos because <laughs> If there is anything that I feel most comfortable sharing, it is my expertise in feline studies. <laughs> also, I think the intersection of cats and justice is grossly underexplored and deserves scholarly merit. <laughs> Given that my mother is watching, I shall refrain. <laughs> As I seriously began writing this lecture last week, things just weren't coming together. For instance, my Microsoft Word kept opening up to Netflix, and I couldn't stop thinking about the work still left to be accomplished, only six months left in my fellowship. After watching copious amounts of The West Wing and other sources of wisdom and pithy one-liners, I began to reflect on the meetings I've had with students since the start of my fellowship, and things began to emerge at, of course, 1.30 a.m. <laughs> Themes from the seemingly innocuous, such as, so I have this cool idea for a new student organization. For those who are in student affairs, not so innocuous, is it? <laughs> I got, the next one is, Pretty concerning. Um, I got four hours of sleep last night after pulling two all-nighters. Hashtag killing it. Um, then there was also the downright heart-wrenching. I don't know how I'm going to pay for tuition. Stories of growing mental health concerns, family crises, and financial strife. These brilliant minds are also our most exhausted and broken spirits. But we're fine, right? As I'm in conversation and relationship with these folks, I can't help but reflect on my own story as a transfer student openly walking in the audacity and anxiety of my black male queerness. Someone that barely made it to classes as he was picking up the pieces from a struggling yet strong family rocked by circumstance. Someone who managed to continue fighting because of the solidarity of his closest friends and colleagues. This truth telling, what I've titled Solidarity and Brokenness, is inspired by that ever evolving story as it intersects with those relationships and stories in this room. So let's get started. Solidarity and brokenness, what does that mean? It is my attempt to illustrate the importance of a praxis of relationship building inspired by the work of community building grounded in honoring, not just being aware of our brokenness. And yes, brokenness is indeed a broad lived experience. It can involve everything from experiences of being marginalized to university life and academic pains, family concerns, emotional breakdowns and breakthroughs. I'm calling out all these things that generate an anger and frustration, but I want to focus today on shame. Brokenness, high school will do that to you. <laughs> My brokenness is nuanced and multifaceted that aligns with the sources of brokenness that I just sketched out for you. When I think about my experiences of marginality, I immediately focus on this black male queerness and the time in which its salience and exposure to judgment was acutely real. 
high school. I led a highly involved life as a drum major, wind ensemble musician, and a thespian. Fun fact, I still believe I was casted as the only openly queer black Jesus in Godspell in South Georgia High School Theater. <laughs> My involved life, however, was also a compartmentalized one. My white friends made the insightful discovery that I was the safe kind of black. My glasses tamed the hyperphysicality that is inextricably linked to an inherent criminality of a black and brown body, or at least some sort of thuggish behavior that was at the core of black manhood. My queerness was also an asset. Like my glasses, it was a tool that somehow civilized my black masculinity. The inherent femininity of queerness was not just contrary to my black masculinity, it muffled the hyper-masculinity and physicality that allowed my voice to be heard, acknowledged, made distinctive from the hood cacophony that assaulted their ears and offended their intellect. Coupled with my impeccable diction on the stage, my complex identity was dissected and analyzed as a set of qualifiers that made me special at best, and that gave me unfair currency, which gave me unearned access to their circles at worst. To receive acknowledgement, let alone affirmation, these needed to be checked. I needed to be checked. This came to the fore when I was confronted with three typical phrases. But you're different. Oh my, you're so articulate. I get to have a black and gay best friend. My response wasn't a brave refutation of this denial of my complexity. My response was deflection. Insert a well-placed joke to lighten the mood, smile coldly to affirm, laugh openly to disarm. Armed with these oppressive logics that I rationalized as strategies for survival, I walked humbly into the hallowed halls of higher education. These strategies worked really well at my first college, and as an aspiring performer, the narrow focus of the program has made it easy. But not at Wake Forest. You all have the nerve to ask your students to lead lives of meaning, to live lives of service. For someone that has a natural pro proclivity for reflection, but an even stronger will to avoid the dark places of real introspection, I was destined to experience a bit of turbulence along this journey. The text that I sought to master, the numerical literacy demanded of me, all required a focus that dangerously aroused certain monsters that I kept pacified. Envy woke from its dulled state, determined to consume all forms of joy with fear ready to go. And Shane smiled oh so knowingly as we made the pact to keep my secrets from destroying an image that I was cultivating and the respect that I was garnering. My counterattack was to completely immerse myself in student organizations. After trying a few different ones, I settled on the Roosevelt Institute for one semester. One year later, I was a policy director of defense and diplomacy. Two years later, I was a regional coordinator for the South and the president of my chapter. So much for that one semester. My thinking was that I struck a decisive blow to the principalities of envy, shame, and fear, as my mother would say. Wrong. As I was ruling the world, I was, I was failing stats twice. I was embracing mediocrity in my other classes if I decided to go. New monsters had awakened as old ones laughed in my attempts to further stem their influence on my life. By day, I was Olivia Pope. <laughs> and by night, I was also Olivia Pope. <laughs> <laughs> While I substituted popcorn for sun chips, the settlement was still the same. I was so desperately wanted to go, I so desperately wanted to do good and do well, but I could not let anyone close to this brokenness. Asking for help meant breaking the pact with shame. It meant coming out of the darkness as an utterly exhausted perfectionist that carries around enough anxiety to power all of Winston-Salem. It meant coming out as imperfect and dragging my family into the showcase of my inadequacy. Speaking of which, <laughs> adding a whole new cast of characters meant introducing some much needed but uncomfortable exposition. My family boasts a legacy of land orders in South Florida, of moonshine runners to Cuba, of brave soldiers, of fierce matriarchs, and selfless givers. My mother embodies this legacy. In addition to raising four beautiful children, she's held positions in executive leadership at Phillips Serena, the Georgia Dome, and the Georgia World Congress Center before she held a college diploma. Because of her, I am. So in 2012, when she slipped into a diabetic coma as I started my second semester at Wake Forest, I left this mother so dear to take care of my actual mother so dear. Such was the start of an even bumpier road with the potholes of bodily health downturns, 
including additional visits to the hospital, depression, and the continued giving of oneself to communities that did not pour back into her, financially and otherwise. It was my attempt to keep control or challenge an Elsa before there even was an Elsa. I prepped myself for her death. Every day I would go through my checklist of what to do if my mother dies because I was so afraid that I would be caught unprepared. If the soul crushing hurt was going to happen, it would be under my own terms. It was during those times I just prayed for normal distress. I wanted the fear of paper deadlines rather than the fear of poverty. The normalcy that I would give anything to be my only concern was the normalcy she, would, she deserved to be her only concern. This was the treasure that shame guarded as it prevented me from truly connecting with others as I built these sort of transactional relationships in which I became counsel and caring friend, but don't you dare turn that shit on me. Brene Brown says that shame needs three things to survive. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. It wasn't until I was caught slipping in my performance of normalcy and let the wires of I'm fine and everything's great show that I sort of ran into what shame was really holding onto as part of our Faustian bargain. As I traded my soul and my humanity to not be okay for the power of a self-assured kind, shame was all too happy to take it and kick the real gifts of self-acceptance and self-worth underneath the table. What I didn't anticipate was my sloppiness and the power of a divine magic that aligned my path with other broken beings. One being actually lost her mother and stability and yet still had room in her storm for me. Our journey into the richness of our blackness and our brokenness had taken us in the middle of Davis Field at 12.30 a.m. to Harvard. With another, I explored the depths of an Afro-queerness that was not only beautiful as it was nuanced, it also was host to cultural productions that affirmed my beauty even as white gay men continued to uphold narratives of homonormativity. And another forced me to think deeply about the very nature of existence as we unpacked everything from social epistemology to interfaith engagement. Before too long, I was surrounded by a sea of broken and radiant beings. All holding up mirrors, not in a concerted effort to expose me, but to send a community-wide message. You're not okay, and we love you for it. I share these experiences with you not to elicit pity, but to encourage reflection on your brokenness and its beauty. The relationships in this room are enriched when they become spaces in which we can honor our brokenness. This allows us to cultivate self-healing and community healing as we individually and collectively disconnect shame from its sources of nourishment, secrecy, silence, and judgment. As we begin to develop the self-awareness of when shame appears, openly name it, and be courageous, courageous to connect and to share anyway, we exercise a certain resilience. Furthermore, sharing our stories also reveals the intricacies of lived experiences whose foregrounding is vital to the work of a specific kind of justice, of intersectional justice. It is a justice that does away with oppressive hierarchies and weight lines for liberation. It is a praxis of liberation that recognizes difference, interconnectivity, to build equitable communities for all. Contrary to my ego, nothing I'm saying is new. However, the salience of this message is evident in our daily interactions and this community whose less than affirming dynamics are likely shared by other communities and captured in everyday discourse. There's a war going on out there and we need warriors. Social justice warriors! Maggot! Are you ready to promote social justice, acceptance, and tolerance? Yes, sir! What did you call me? Yes, ma'am! You want to try that again? Yes! Gender neutral pronoun! <laughs> there may be hope for you yet, maggot! Let me hear your war cry! Everyone deserves basic dignity and respect! Basic training begins now! On the battlefield, you maggots will encounter fake facts, and you must know how to disarm them! Blacks are lazy and eating up all the food stamps! Actually, the majority of food stamps go to white families! Planned Parenthood harvests baby parts for profit! That claim is based on an intentionally misleading video from anti-abortion activists! Muslims were celebrating in New Jersey after 9-11! There is zero footage or eyewitness reports that ever happened! All right, maggot, this room simulates the YouTube comment section. Consider this your trigger warning. Okay. Ben, First grade teachers need to be armed. Donald 
disruption of press by the car. Yes, and I'll Good job, maggots. We're in this war together. And for your final test, you'll have to pass target practice. Feminism isn't about taking away the rights of men. It's about equal rights for everyone. Political correctness is just treating others with respect. The bigger question is, why do you want to say politically incorrect things so badly? Why aren't you saying anything? There's nothing for me to say. It would be inappropriate for me to dominate this particular conversation. Good job, maggot! Can you stop calling us maggots, please? It's disrespectful, and fly larvae are an invaluable part of our ecosystem. Excellent point, soldiers! Congratulations. You are all officially social justice warriors. You will be on the front lines of social justice. Twitter, Tumblr, <coughs> Facebook, Reddit threads, and I know you will make me proud. Now go out there and give them hell! Respectfully. There's so many microaggressions. <laughs> microaggressions, too! What did they say? They said white privilege didn't exist. Okay, that offends me. I, I benefited from white privilege. That offends me. <laughs> While only a few of you may have seen this video, you're likely familiar with the real world situations from which it draws inspiration. Unlike this lighthearted video, we may actually encounter a perverse competitive and zero sum activism. The freshly conscious and the seasoned warriors alike can tend to focus on shoring up their own legitimacy by demonstrating effective use of pushback, critical analyses, and a well placed phenomenon reference. These are employed to defend their type of activism from a steady and crouching problematic ally. But in the name of justice, of course. We become fatigued by the requirement to stay in, to stay relevant, to stay connected. And if you dare falter in your journey, you become the honored guest to a performativity of critical awareness in which you can expect to be unveiled in the public and digital square as a charlatan that you truly are. With the wisdom of Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks, you will be read to filth, and as the shadiest of them all, as Elizabeth Busby likes to point out, I will likely be there. <laughs> all these civic duties as conscious citizens are grounded in a politics of absolutism masking our desire for belonging and worthiness as we perform and perfect. These are contrary to the work of solidarity and brokenness. To do that means to believe the crazed notion that multiple forms of activism aren't only valid, but needed. To engage in that praxis means to practice a bit of courage to take a step back, to recharge, reconnect, and foster relationships that allow others to do the same. So how do we actually employ this repackaged wisdom? In working with other students, the best relationships were the ones in which we both practice this sort of trifecta of wholeness. Courage, compassion, and connection. To practice courage is to speak openly and honestly about who we are, what we're feeling in our experiences. To practice compassion is to practice acceptance of ourselves and others in relationships in which we stand as equals. To practice connection is to create relation relationships of affirmation and nourishment. Sounds pretty easy, right? And then there's this whole myth of self-sufficiency that we have to dismantle. This insidious myth prompts us to falsely equate self-sufficiency with self-worth. And its dismantling requires us to believe that we are inherently worthy of love and belonging. I am, you are, we are enough. Right now, unacceptable and an unconditional acceptance, irreducible worth. This tripartite practice is best coupled with a commitment to radical empathy, a tapping into the power of marginality and brokenness. In wielding and walking radical empathy, you connect with the experience of being marginalized to affirm others that are too being marginalized. This practice is invaluable to the work of justice as those who continue to be the butt of societies, racist, sexist, homophobic, ableist, fattist, and imperialist jokes are also the ones risking their well-being and often in-group membership to dismantle those interwoven systems. As practice of Justice, it is our responsibility to tap into experiences of marginality, to connect and affirm, as we too hashtag shut it down. Like the transformative vision and processes this hashtag describes, this empathy is likewise radical, because it is yet, a, yet another practice of bucking against the damaging business of usual and the namely, myth, namely that myth of self-sufficiency. 
And lastly, shared accountability. It can be the most needed and the most challenging. Why? Because it involves two challenging and needed things. One, it asks us to internalize that work of relationship building is not a benchmark, but rather an iterative process. It asks us to create intentional practices of caring for our relationships. Second, it demands of us to be vulnerable about what we need in our relationships, share the misalignment between our needs and the care being put into them, and be open to hearing that from others. Consequently, shared accountability at its core denotes and captures a process of intentional acts of caring for a relationship, the sharing of impact and commitment to move forward. Stitched and practiced together, these are three of many tools sketched out by those that came before me, coalescing into one practice of timeless yet timely wisdom. Tell your story, own it, affirm others in their narratives, and seize these moments of connected brokenness as we are all intentional in the care of these divine relationships. I've learned this lesson from being in community with some of the most amazing students fighting for racial justice, students dismantling rape culture, students tackling food justice and economic equity and access. In your practice, you not only taught me, you loved me. And so it follows. If we are committed to the work of intersectional justice and healing, we must cultivate relationships that honor our multifaceted and nuanced brokenness. We must create communities and movements in which the organizer, the policy wonk, the artist, and the intellectual are all uplifted, up, uplifted in their gifts of imperfection and liberation. We must create spaces in which we are allowed to disconnect and fall apart. And we must mine our intellectual cachets for words that love even as we are called and call others to their higher conscious woke selves. In dismantling systems that already seek to silence and steal our humanity, let us not lose ours. Thank you. Mm. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs>